The September 24, 2012 meeting of the Agenda Charter Committee will now come to order. Will the clerk call the roll, please? Chairwoman Boyce? Here. Ms. Cayley? Here. Mr. McCann? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mr. Racco? Here. Is there anybody signed up for the public forum? There are 10 public forum speakers signed up this evening. When I call your name, please come forward to address the committee. You will have two minutes in which to state your remarks, and we ask that you conclude when the timer sounds. And we thank you for your cooperation. If I could, as the chair, uh, I know this is a very um, emotional issue. Um, I think that people um, that are here really truly believe that, you know, that this is the right thing to do, and I, I, I appreciate that. Everybody can, you know, appreciate the fact that they want to come and speak. And uh, the only thing I would caution is that there's not any outbursts from people in the audience because that's disrespectful and I want to be able to, you know, be able to understand and to hear what people have to say. So I'd greatly appreciate um, all of us being respectful of each other. Thank you. Our first speaker is Lawrence Tracy. Our next speaker is Sister Beth LaVallee. My name is Sister Beth Valley, and I'm here as a Sister of St. Joseph, but also as a member of uh, GRCC's Faith in Action Network. And I want to first of all show you um, the sisters are organizing, and everybody's invited a bus tour, if you follow that, nuns on the bus. So we're having a local tour on October 16th, and I'll submit this because you're more than welcome to join us. But I say that because we Sisters of St. Joseph would like to extend an invitation to the legislators who have not had a chance to go to Oaxaca Cemetery and or if you'd like to return with us on the bus um, and visit again and have some conversations about it. Now, since Jan the end of January, I have had the pleasure, uh, very difficult at times, of facilitating the burial services uh, at the cemetery where there's been no family. Most of those burials are at Oaxaca. We have some 20 ministers who have rotated going there and several, several attendees. So we are very conversant with the condition of that cemetery. And that's why we wanted to say uh, to have you, if you've already been there, but we could go back together and, and have some conversation about it. We are also, as a faith community, trying to do some service things. We have a grant to help improve that particular cemetery. So what we would like to do is work in mutuality with you as the government who sends forth the funds and uh, oversees the processes to help improve that particular cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. And I have names of a number of sisters that are willing to invite you. We could have had probably 50 more, but there you are. OK, thank, thank you. None of them were the ones that racked my nuts when I was in school. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Our next speaker is Marvin Mitch. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. My name is Marvin Mish. I'm Director of Social Policy at Catholic Family Center and on the board of the Greater Rochester Community of Churches. I have been involved with this burial issue since, since the spring of 2006 when Maggie Brooks made her decision. We were part of an advocacy group that tried to get the re decision reversed for some four years, led by Sister Grace Miller and others. <clears throat> In um, 2010, the summer of 2010, uh, Mel Walzig reached out to us at GRCC to form a supplemental burial fund to assist what the county is able to provide. And the Greater Rochester Community of Churches agreed to that. And for the last two years, we've been raising money that is a supplement to what the county provides. This is not easy work, as you can imagine. Um, so far, we have given out a number of grants through Cheryl Clark at the burial fund. Um, we only have, we have about $7,000 in our fund right now, which doesn't go very far when you have many needs. So uh, the question before us is, when is the county legislature going to take up this question? It's been in the community for over six years, and we feel it is time that this body takes up that, the question of 
adequate and dignified burial. So that is my feeling as a, a citizen and advocate on behalf of the poor in our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Reverend William Baez. Well, thank you for hearing me. Uh, I'm the Reverend uh, Dr. Wilfredo Baez, and I'm the pastor of the United Methodist Church of North Chile. I represent the Genesee Valley District of the United Methodist Churches on the Greater Rochester Council of Churches Faith and Action Network Board. And I wish to encourage this committee uh, to put on the county, the county legislature agenda the proposed burial initiative. The issue of dignified burial for those who cannot afford one is dear to the heart of the members of the United Methodist Church of North Chile and the United Methodist Churches in the Genesee Valley District. We believe that human beings are made in the image of God and are regarded highly by God. We believe that the love of God and the love of neighbor are our highest values. And we know that we are charged to care for the poor, even the last and the least of our human family. And we believe that the people we vote for should value these things. There's a saying that we can measure how civilized a society is by how we treat our dead. Should we simply put the remains of a deceased in the ground unmarked? What do you think? The county legislature has an opportunity to make a statement of just how civilized Monroe County is, of just how much the legislature cares for the people it represents, and to make a lasting difference even for those who cannot speak up for themselves. But the legislature doesn't stand a chance of doing so without you putting it on the agenda. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Shaquan Woods. Good evening, my name is Shaquan Woods. Sister Grace is not here due to being away on retreat. Sister Grace is praying for us as we speak. Improvements at Owaka Cemetery are much needed. However, the very important issue is the 1250 given by MCHS. This 1250 will only cover the cost of ORE. We need to have the costly pay for the caskets plus cemetery plot. We asked the county legislative to approve the process which will help poor families bury their loved ones with dignity. I just lost a loved one of mine and I hope he will be buried where he's supposed to be. Not at Owaka, thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Gregory. Well, I think the idea, uh, the notion behind the uh, referral is a good one. We should be taking care of our poor but uh, I think there's a few things we should be looking at how we do it. And I had a couple of conversations with other people. I said I thought the best way for us to go about doing this would be through the forming of a limited development corporation. I think that'd be much better than this uh, idea here, which is go in a charter amendment. Our charters and constitutions are very rigid documents, are very hard to change once you put the language in. The benefit of having a limited development corporation is that the limited development corporation could self-fund, it could contract, it could utilize a county funds, it could actually make agreements with uh, some of the religious. I know the Catholic Church owns a brand new cemetery out there in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, they could actually contract with that and find a maybe a more appropriate ground as well as take monies from collections from church agencies that could be collected and basically d deposit to in, in the care of the LDC. Uh, I, would, I know there's a strong bias in this county against limited development corporations, but they do have a time and they do have a place, and I think this is one of them. 
I read the referral, and I'll, the referral I would re ask one of the legislators to refer it to county law because I think once, uh, section 174-4F of the referral is actually an absorption of the administrative capacity of the county executive. County executive is not only an executive, but she's also the chief administrator of the, of the county. And in that, in that role and in that capacity, it's her res it's a responsibility of the Commissioner of Human Services, I believe from other things I've read, to report to the county administrator in that capacity. I believe that uh, section 174-4F uh, would basically absorb county power. The, uh, the other thing, let's see. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kevin Robinson. My name is Kevin Robinson. Um, I was just sitting here listening to some of the conversations that were going on. I really appreciate you guys dressing up Owaka Cemetery, but I don't want to be buried there. What we're, we are requesting significant funds from the county for a dignified burial for the poorest of the poor. A dignified burial would consist of the following, transportation of the body, dressing, casket, viewing, funeral, and burial. Now, of course, burial would include cemetery, uh, the cemetery vault and digging of the grave. I don't know if I could believe that we don't have the money because we've got apparently, um, if I'm not mistaken, you've got slots of people, positions that are not filled, which is money can be spent. You've got phone services that can be cut that aren't used, that can be used to, to help. You've got cars. You've got transportation that can be used. So I'm listening to all the things you guys put together. I think you guys can make a, a difference when it comes to burying the poor people. Unless you all, let's see, if each one of you give $1,000, maybe people at the House of Mercy wouldn't have to bother y'all for a little while. But other than that, you guys really need to do the right thing. All right. Our next speaker is Rita Lewis. Sister Grace would have been here tonight um, if it weren't that she left for a retreat on Saturday. But I spoke with her just a couple hours ago, and she said, let them know that I am praying. I am praying that the right thing be done and that justice is finally given to the poor. This issue of burying the poor Burying the dead is very, I mean, it is very heart-wrenching. It is for us. Because the people do come to us looking for help. And, you know, all we can tell them is we don't have $1,000 to help you bury your loved one. And we really, really need you to change the policy, do what you need to do so that the county can provide the casket, the cemetery plot. Those are the items the families cannot come up with to pay for. And it is just too heart-wrenching for many of them to cremate their loved ones. So please, rethink this whole policy and provide what's needed to simply do what is right for the poor in our community. Please don't have another poor family go through the heart-wrenching experience of not knowing how they're going to pay for their loved one's funeral. It, it just is the right thing to do. So we are asking you, we're imploring you to do the right thing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vincent Shelton.
Good afternoon. My name is Vincent Shelton, and I'm a member of the burial committee based out of the House of Mercy. There's a correlation between the conditions at Owaka Cemetery and the conditions poor families are subjected to when seeking a dignified burial for their loved one. Although there are some improvements being made to the conditions at Owaka Cemetery, let's not underscore conditions and needs of those poor families. For years, Sister Grace Miller has tried to persuade the county to change their present policy to one that is more equitable in meeting the needs of poor families and seeking a dignified burial for their loved one. In light of the present state of the economy and Mon Monroe County's 30% poverty rate, there's clearly a need for a change in the county's policies and financial assistance to the poor seeking a dignified burial for their loved ones. I hope that you will consider the pro proposals that will be submitted today and that you will move in a compassionate way to make changes that are needed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Avant. Hi, my name is Michelle Avant. I'm here representing the House of Mercy, Sister Grace, Sister Rita. And I'm here because of the lack of money for proper burial for the poor. And right now it's $1,250. And um, that's not enough, it's not adequate. And we're asking the county to cover the total cost for the burial for the poor. Um, and that would include transportation of the body, viewing the body, the caskets, um, funeral, the burial, cemetery. Um, it is a cry out to the county to help the poor. Um, God forbid that the tables were turn, turned and, um, you know, the shoe was on the other feet. You know, you'll be in the same predicament. So we're asking if you could just have some sympathy and um, help with a proper burial for the poor, because right now it's not enough, it's not adequate. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Lawrence Tracy. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a Roman Catholic priest uh, doing outreach ministry in the Latino community. I apologize for being late. My handicap slows me down. In my ministry, I probably do well over a hundred funerals a year for Spanish-speaking families, and the vast majority of these are people who are poor. Um, also, a very large number are families whose loved ones are deceased because of tragic circumstances. I had a funeral two weeks ago of a 20-year-old man that was murdered. Um, regularly do funerals for newborn babies and children under a year, uh, suicides, people who die of liver failure because of drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and uh, it has been very difficult in the last five years to accommodate these families because of the restricted uh, amount of money the county provides for burials. Um, I support this legislation as far as it goes because at least it provides a decent burial site for affordable cemetery burial. I have had funerals at Oatka and it's very harsh, very spartan, very uh, unresponsive. Um, but we really need to provide uh, a greater financial support so that people 
while they're supposed to be mourning a loved one, are running around between church and neighbors and family to try to get enough money for decent burial for their loved ones. Um, and very frequently what happens is that because uh, they find Owatka unacceptable and cremation unacceptable, they have to spend anywhere up to a week and a half to two weeks to delay the burial so they can get enough money to uh, support this. So I would uh, hope that there are men and women on both sides of the aisle with compassion who would support this legislation. Thank you. This concludes the public forum. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. You have the August 20th, uh, 2012 minutes before you. They will stand approved unless the clerk is notified of any changes by the end of the day. Um, Madam Clerk, new business. Referral 12-270, establishing a dignified indigent burial policy. Moved by Ms. Kelly, seconded by Mr. O'Brien. Is there any discussion? I will uh, recognize the maker of the motion. Um, first of all, I'd like to give my thanks to the administration for recognizing this referral. Um, as we've heard tonight, uh, whereas the topic of bur burial reform has been labeled an issue of emotions and compassion, I'm proud to have it before the Agenda Charter Committee this evening for consideration. I will say, though, that um, this referral does not advance the numerous requests for funding. Uh, it does not deal with that at all. But with the current situation, the following are true. Serious deficiencies currently exist in Monroe County's indigent burial program, uh, more so in its final execution. Of particular concern are the conditions at the cemetery where the largest number of indigent burials have occurred over the last five years. Over the course of the three years that I've witnessed, um, I've seen graves clustered in what I consider to be the equivalent of a modern Potter's Day field, golf clubs marking rows of plots as well as individuals, bare soil on graves with burial dates of over three months and no seed, and also over a few over a year that have little or no grass on them at all. Um, obvious bad drainage and uh, our conditions that exist, as well as large areas with no markers at all. When and where these conditions occur, funeral homes and cemeteries are truly responsible. As no one has objected from the government before, any one business would not know that they might be at fault or lacking in respect. However, I do believe that they are responsible for the final resting arrangements and conditions, which in many cases are paid for from the indigent burial program in Monroe County. These, these funds in part from the state of New York and from Monroe County constitute a responsibility for proper and consistent use to ensure the recipients and payers are receiving the most and best use of local and state funding when burying their loved ones. As county legislators, we have an obligation to ensure our, co our community's most vulnerable residents that they are laid to rest in appropriate and respectful conditions, as well as correct usage of said funding. We are not requesting any additional funding for this referral, but we are stating that everyone deserves respect and consistent honor as they are passed on. We can fulfill part of our obligation tonight by passing this proposed legislation. Our proposal would ensure that cemeteries and funeral homes contracting with the county must adhere to basic standards. By enacting this proposal, we will send a strong message to our community that everyone deserves respect in life and in death. I urge you to look at what is now and voice your opinion on what there should be. Without a clear policy, there will be little or no change. In any one of these graves could be a friend or relative of any of us in chambers today. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, at this time, as the chair, um, I've, I've looked through the legislation, um, I've uh, gone over some of the, the law within New York State and federal government with regards to this piece of legislation. And um, I believe there to be a, a bit of misinformation that was has been um, put out um, in the community with regards to this. So at this point, um, I've asked Kelly Reed as well as Deputy Commissioner Bob Franklin to be here 
to answer and to give an explanation to some of these, um, some of the information here. So, Ms. Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, and would certainly begin my comments uh, with a full understanding that the topic of indigent burial is, is very sensitive um, uh, and, and is something that people feel very strongly about in this community. I appreciate the comments made in public forum tonight and also the comments made uh, by Legislator Kaylee as, as she introduced um, this legislation. My understanding is that you are about to vote on a local law entitled the Dignified burial program from Monroe County. And before you do, I, th I do think that there's some really important things to clarify about the indigent burial process as it's set forth by New York State. And let me again say to you that I do recognize that um, when, s when a loved one is lost, there is uh, tremendous uh, stress associated with that and for those who cannot afford to bury their loved ones that stress is compounded uh, significantly I appreciate that tremendously however that being said um, as Commissioner of Human Services and as I review the laws and the rules and regulations associated with um, what a Department of Social Services can do related to indigent burial I regrettably have to advise you against this referral I don't believe it is supportable under the current governmental structure that we operate under, and I also don't believe that it is supportable under the rules and regulations that guide the practice of the Department of Human Services. There are specifically five points that I would raise, and then I'd be happy to um, entertain questions as well, but these are the five that I think stand in the way of um, uh, what you're cons considering this evening. First, while there appears to be a significant belief in the community and um, among uh, folks in, in this chamber this evening that there's an indigent burial program administered by the Department of Human Services, there is not. Uh, burial assistance for the indigent is simply a pay line that exists within the TANF and safety net um, uh, pay lines that we have that guide the work that we do for those who are eligible for TANF and safety net assistance. We do employ staff that evaluate the eligibility of someone for an indigent burial payment, and we facilitate that payment to appropriate vendors. However, there is no indigent burial program to be reformed. Number two, with regard to the determination of the eligibility guidelines, as Commissioner of Human Services, I do not set and I am not able to alter those guidelines. They are prescribed by New York State. My sole role is the assurance that the guidelines are consistently and fairly applied to anyone who is eligible for them. Whether the guidelines themselves are actually fair as they exist inside those rules and regulations is not my and nor is it your role to determine at this local level. This is a fight that's being fought in the wrong room in the wrong town. This is a New York State rule and regulation. It is set by the New York State Legislature, not by anyone that is in this chamber this evening. Similarly, number three, social services law does not prescribe what can be purchased with an indigent burial payment. Therefore, I don't have the authority to mandate the, per the purchase, for instance, of a permanent marker, as was laid out in um, uh, the comments that were made at the Democratic Caucus um, uh, press conference and in the uh, referral that has been made to you. I don't have the authority and frankly who am I to determine what kinds of things must be mandated as a purchase for anyone. I think part of it of uh, dignified burial is for a family to be able to decide what they spend those dollars on. And I also believe that a legal opinion were, would have to be obtained in order to uh, address the issue of how we would proceed if you did employ this mandate and someone chose not to spend their $1,250 on a marker. I don't know how I would proceed in that particular case, but I, I have at this point, in my opinion, as I review my, the rules and regulations, no right to assert, assert that authority over um, a grieving family. Number four, with regard to requiring particular maintenance of grounds, 
for cemeteries receiving a voucher. First, let me clarify that we don't voucher. We do not offer vouchers to cemeteries. We pay a funeral parlor and they pay a cemetery for the work that they are doing on behalf of that funeral parlor. In addition, there are no rules or regulations that allow me to assert authority over a privately owned cemetery with regard to how, how they maintain their grounds. And fifth, and I think um, in many ways most importantly, the county legislature does, does not have the ability to create a law that would influence the actions of the Commissioner of Human Services as he or she implements the rules and regulations of New York State. By New York State law, the social service district is created to, to deliver services on behalf of New York State. While I certainly appreciate and enjoy a very strong relationship with all members of the county legislature, I'm actually acting as an agent of the state of New York in the delivery of the services that I deliver. So I again point out to you that the battle that is um, being suggested here is an important one. I do not. I am not making these comments in any way to reflect that I don't think that there's huge merit in the issue of, an, of a dignified burial. But this is being fought in the wrong room, in the wrong town, with the wrong folks. This is not something that county legislators, I believe, can um, do. The, the sole role of a county legislator in this particular role is to appropriate funds related to the delivery of services on behalf of the state through the social service district in this county. Um, I'd be happy to, to entertain your questions and um, I would just finish again that my comments are not related to the intention of, of the referral, they're related specifically to whether or not it can be accepted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Questions from the legislators and the committee, please. Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Not so much a question, uh, it is really just a, a countervailing point of view, and I'll go through them line by line. Uh, but you know, the suggestion is that the that we are simply talking about a pay line here within TANF and Safety Net, and uh, and that we have no indigent burial program in, in this county. And we, of course, as a county legislative body by by statute, are the policy making um, board for for this county. And it is incumbent upon us to uh, put, promote policies uh, that our employees and the, and the citizens of this county work uh, under. And it is entirely appropriate for us to set basic uh, ground rules. Uh, for, for example, the Department of Health is also an instrumentality of the state. We are a political subdivision of the state. In the Department of Health, we could, we could certainly set policies uh, that were not less stringent than what the state promotes, but could be stricter than what the state promotes. And that was that, that is within our uh, purview. So that if a restaurant needs to be, if we have uh, more stringent uh, conditions with respect to um, cleanliness or safety issues than what the state uh, on its own uh, promotes, we, we have, we clearly have it within our power as county legislators to dictate those. And the same thing is, is true here. And whether guidelines are fair or not is our role to determine as county legislatures. Um, the, um, the idea that, that the social services law does not prescribe what can be purchased uh, has been promoted. Uh, but we certainly, uh, as the policy making body for this, for this county, uh, certainly can prescribe minimum standards that, um, um, that uh, could be pursued in, in what is to be uh, purchased. Um, on the maintenance of grounds issue, uh, again, we have the authority to, to provide minimum standards for an industry like cemeteries and funeral homes. Uh, it, happens, it happens all the time in, in a number of different uh, industries. And to say that uh, the county legislature has no ability to direct the Department of Human Services because they're agent of the state, you know, it isn't just, I, I have a disagreement with that. Uh, the county is in fact the political subdivision of the state and it's not only do we have the authority, we have the obligation to set the policy making uh, decisions for this county. And uh, with all due respect to, um, to Commissioner Reed, who I think uh, does an excellent job, uh, 
to say, to say that we are not empowered to do these things just isn't factually correct. We could clearly adopt these things, and we should. It's the right thing to do. Mr. Rocco? The uh, thing that uh, came to my attention was that uh, you, you, I believe you had mentioned that you're not willing to raise the amount of the individual burial payments. Can you um, comment on that through the chair? Through you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, one of the questions that is often raised and that folks talk a lot about is the, um, the fact that there's a, a payment of $1,250 that is made to, um, uh, for an indigent burial. And is made to the to the family, and that that is not a satisfactory amount to address what the community has identified as um, a dignified burial. That um, uh, decision was made in um, Monroe County, act, actually by um, uh, the acting commissioner of human services, just prior to my coming on board um, in uh, June of 2006, um, and it's remained. Uh, $1,250 for that period of time. Um, actually, it's interesting to ask, if I, am, I, am I willing to increase the amount? Uh, frankly, I believe that in, in many ways I have, because in um, 2010, New York State reduced the amount that it um, makes available to the local district for TANF and safety net payments from 50% to 29%. Typically when that happens, um, we assign a cut to whatever program is, uh, takes that hit from the state, so to speak, when, 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 when we reduce that amount. I did not reduce the amount for indigent burial at that time, although we could have, because it, um, all of the additional money, the difference between the 29 and 50 percent, was borne by the local taxpayer dollar in my department. That happened in mid-2010. I did not recommend a change in it in the 2011 budget. I did not recommend a change in the 2012 budget, and I have not recommended a change for the 2013 budget. Although the amount of money that the local taxpayer is paying for this because of the state cut remains significant. So in essence, in my opinion, um, maintaining it is uh, uh, certainly more than due diligence. Was an increase in this fee? Where would that, um, where would those funds be offset from? How, who would cover the increase? It would be a local taxpayer uh, uh, amount of money, and what I would have to do is cut a service to someone else in order to achieve it. Um, through the chair, how many indigent burial payments does DHS handle in one year? Can you? Sure. Through the chair, in uh, 2010, there were 725 payments made, and in 2011, there were 741. And, and of those numbers, can you reflect on how many, I mean, is there, is there statistics how many of those folks um, end up at Owaka Cemetery? Is there, is there a number that we know of those 741 that are buried at Owaka? Through the chair, we're estimating it somewhere at around seven to eight percent of them. It's certainly less than ten percent of those burials are um, actually where, where the body is laid at, at Owaka Cemetery. And, and the rest of these folks are buried at various cemeteries throughout the county. Is that correct? Through the chair, that is correct. Anything further, Mr. Rocco? Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to clear up a couple things, but I also wanted to bring your attention. We did have um, just a couple of photographs of the conditions at that particular cemetery that Legislator Rocco has spent a great deal of time talking about, um, and I'd like to be able to pass them out to the to the uh, legislators. You can give them to the clerk. Thank you. I would like them to be on display, if at all possible, during this last section. And I would add through the chair that these were taken a week ago Sunday. Too late. 
It's just two sets. Oh. It's just two sets with numerous pictures. Again, I would like to, through you to everyone in the chambers, um, come back to the purpose of this referral, and it has nothing to do with increasing any funding for the burial process that exists now. Um, I have heard this uh, burial program referred to as burial program any number of times, and um, so respectfully to um, Ms. Reed, I have heard it referred to from many members of staff as a burial program, quote unquote. Um, I, I would like to say um, to Ms. Reed that the, the essence of the referral is not to spend $1,250 on a marker. The essence of the referral is to make a consistent effort from the funeral homes that supply the markers that the markers, no matter how modest they be, do not disintegrate within a year's time or less, depending on the weather. What I have noticed in the past six months is that they have become even flimsier than they were before and, and more subject to bad weather. And that is what the nature of this is. And I apologize if it's not clear enough, uh, but that is what we are talking about when we talk about markers. Um, as far as policy setting the requirements for a funeral home or cemetery, they are guidelines. They are intended to be minimalistic, but to be consistent, giving respect to the people that are buried wherever they're buried. Um, these flimsy markers that I have witnessed would not just be at Awatka Creek. They would be at any cemetery where a person who was buried along with indigent burial funds was interred. It's not acceptable anywhere. They are too flimsy. They disintegrate in weather. Um, it's also the consistency, I would say, in additional remarks. You may see a marker that is perfectly clear in that it has had never anything written on it, never a name, never a date, never a birth date, never a death date. Again, left unchecked, and I consider it to be unchecked by those that are performing the task paid for in part by county funds is not acceptable. And I do believe that it is within our power to set policy for those minimal funds that are given out to a funeral home who then disperses it to a cemetery to do the bare minimal that gives respect to the person that's been interred. And I find it, frankly, I am uh, abashed. I'm amazed that we have no ability to set a standard for burying a human being. I just find that amazing. I doubt that the, that the state of New York would take any umbrage to that if we sent a policy that said we will have markers that don't disintegrate within a year's time. Doesn't have to be anything different other than one of the metal markers that's in that picture. It just is a consistent way of honoring the person that has died. And I would no, I I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a bit scattered, and I, I apologize. Um, but also, I will say that um, given all this information now of 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 Commissioner Reed's understanding of the law in New York State with regards to burials, that I find it disheartening because when this referral was first offered as a resolution, I asked for input from President of the Legislature and others as to what the problem was. And I was given no such information if, in fact, that you had had this conversation with President Adair or the leader of the um, Republican Legislature they did not relay any of that to me at all. And I expected to have a meeting with everyone present as we had two meetings going forward with both, both sides of the legislature there. And we expected another one. And my response was that the decision had been made. Um, there would be a postcard perhaps and an update in the website. And this was information that I received from Legislator Daniele. 
Now, I don't know what a postcard would serve, and I will say that merely updating, and I don't say merely because I realize that merely updating a website is not easy, but giving information on, on burial funding and what it serves only on the internet is not sufficient because the, fee, the people that are looking to us for assistance are not necessarily those that are going to be able to go to the website and certainly not when they're upset uh, given whether or not they have a computer in their home or whether or not they have to use a computer in the library. I can't imagine burying a loved one and using the library to see what the policy is. But we have no policy. Um, and that's it for right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. What time? Ms. Reed, would you like to respond to any of this? Or are you? You all okay? Okay. Mr. McCann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, I have uh, a couple questions for Ms. Reed. Uh, Ms. Reed, you, you said earlier that we don't contract with cemeteries um, and, and that we make the, the payments. Uh, uh, the assistant goes to the individuals who then deal with the funeral parlors and then they in turn uh, pay the cemeteries and that. Mm -hmm. Have we ever looked at or considered contracting with uh, particular cemeteries or funeral homes for service? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, yes, we have, and actually that's a discussion that we've had with um, uh, members of the uh, uh, Citizens for a Dignified Burial. Um, yes, it, it would be possible for us to do um, a contract. Uh, typically that would be, uh, in our experience, typically that would be with the uh, funeral homes. Um, however, one of the things that I asked the Citizens for Dignified Burial to consider in that process and that I encourage you to think about as well is if we are to um, uh, do a request for proposals for this and we accept a set of um, funeral homes with, with whom we do business, um, we will not be able to do business with any other funeral homes because we will be obliged by our contract to whoever we choose. So for instance, and this does happen quite often in um, the 700 and so burials that we have, if someone was um, born and raised in Lyons but dies in Monroe County um, uh, and is uh, covered by our indigent burial program and that family wants um, uh, their loved one to be taken care of in that county, we will not be able to issue the $1,250. We'll be obliged to the contracted folks we have um, that we would work with. So we had asked them to consider, and I ask you to consider as well, whether that's something that you want to have happen. Because I think there are, um, uh, with, with changes like that, there can be unintended consequences. Again, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Reed, could you tell us how our uh, our contribution towards indig indigent burial stacks up with some of our peer counties? Um, through you, Madam Chair, it, it varies widely from county to county. It has a lot to do with um, uh, how a county defines the issue of indigent burial, what qualifies as an indigent burial in some counties. So for instance, if, if what qualifies as an indigent burial is lower than ours, ours is 6,000 for instance, if, you, if it's lower than that, if it's 3,000, you might find that the county would be contributing a lot more um, to an indigent burial, but would be doing less burials than we typically do in this community. Um, we just discovered, um, and if you just, uh, excuse me just for one, one second because we just had actually a conversation with a colleague, my, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Franklin had a conversation with a county just um, uh, la last couple of days and I can give you an example from one of our, um, our, our sister counties. Okay. Um, through, through you Madam Chair, Erie County for instance pays $900 for a burial. Just a minute, Ms. Reed, we're not talking about funding here. A lot of times we spend some of 
funding that goes from the county for an indigent burial. But we are not talking about any additional funding here. What I we are talking about is policy. I understand and that. But this could go to the argument of what the money's being spent on. So if we're giving a certain amount, you're talking about the markers and the quality of the markers and things of that nature. So I think it does some to some degree address the amount of money back. So my ruling is is that we could, this is germane to the conversation. Madam Chair, that, that was my last uh, question. Thank you, Ms. Reed. My, my personal feelings, this definitely is a, a difficult issue. Uh, I, I certainly understand the feelings of everyone uh, who's spoken and everyone uh, who's very passionate about this issue. Um, but from what I've seen and, and what I understand of it, uh, I, I, I think our policy uh, that we have today is, is probably as fair as it can be, and uh, I will be voting no on the referral. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, kind of concluding points. First, uh, one of the hot topics always uh, these days seems to be state mandates, and uh, I know there's been much discussion about that. But one thing that we need to be clear about is that while the state may well mandate um, a service that a county needs to provide, it gives counties wide latitude with respect to how you meet that obligation. And I suppose at some point the state can step in and say you're not meeting the, uh, the mandate. But uh, you know, by way of illustration, we, we had discussion about the fact that this own body, the county legislature, is uh, a mandated expense. Um, because the state says you have to either have a county legislature or board of supervisors. It doesn't say you have to have, for example, a 29-member legislature. And there's wide latitude in how you deliver a service, uh, even, uh, even if it's something that, that the state ultimately wants to retain control over. And that goes to the point of whether or not we have the authority to provide a policy that's right for the people of this county, and I believe that we do. And I don't believe that our current policy is, a, is appropriate or reflective of the decent people that make up this county. And uh, to echo Legislator Cayley's point, this is, we're not talking here about what the allocation should be for indigent burial. That's an important conversation, one that we need to have. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about tonight uh, in terms of how much money it requires to have an appropriate and dignified indigent burial. We're simply talking about one small step designed to offer some small level of understanding for those who have lost their loved one, some measure of respect and dignity uh, to the people that, uh, that proceed through our indigent burial program. And I would urge my colleagues to let some form of reason and compassion prevail and, this, uh, and, and pass this very modest uh, starting point with respect to how we administer the indigent burial program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Yes, uh, Director Dice, uh, Anthony Van Allen, Legislator Van Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, I guess, first of all, thank Legislator Cayley, certainly uh, uh, the administration, uh, Bob Franklin, Kelly Reed, for all the work that they've done on this issue. The, the reason we're here tonight is because certainly uh, this is an issue that has come up at many legislator meetings from public forum. We've received many phone calls. I won't say many phone calls, several phone calls, emails. Uh, it has been a, an issue that, that the media has spent some time on. And in, in the spirit of what we do here in the legislature, uh, although, and I won't speak for uh, our, our legislative president, but there, there are reasons that this legis piece of legislation could probably not have gotten this far in the process because of certain legal questions uh, of whether or not it's actually enforceable or not. But, but in our efforts to bring more items to the floor, uh, which is something that certainly uh, I think makes everybody happy and allows us to have a conversation rather than having meetings behind closed doors, I, I would say that it should be noted that uh, Legislator Cayley, Legislator O'Brien, myself, the President of the Legislature, Adair, uh, Carla, you the Chair, uh, have, have had several meetings with members of the community, men, members of religious organizations, the administrations, to try to find ways to do a better job with this process. It, it is, you know, and we do use the name program, but, you know, program can be slanted a, a lot of different ways. This is a process 
uh, that we have very little control of, but, but is something that um, you know, the spiritual leaders and, and organizations, private organizations in the community, uh, really need to take more of a hold of. It's, it's not government's job to do everything. We do lend a hand, uh, which is what this does. Philosophically, uh, myself, personally, uh, and also as the majority leader, I, you know, I do have some issue with dictating to families who are already struggling with how to spend the, the, the few dollars they have on what they consider to be important uh, in their family. What might be important to them may not be a marker. It may not be uh, the upkeep of the cemetery. New York State has many, many laws di dictating how funeral homes and, and cemeteries act and certain standards uh, already in place. So to say that they're you know, f you know, free, free Nelly making decisions is, is incorrect. It, they are a highly regulated industry uh, and, and in general do a good job. You know, my problem with this piece of legislation is in fact that we are dictating how private citizens spend the money uh, during a time and, and these specific citizens who are at a time of, of grief and certainly not many means to say that you have to spend money on this, that and the other. And you know, to say that the cemeteries need to do a better job keeping, it, keeping up the cemeteries, we're talking about seven to eight percent roughly uh, going to Awatka, passing something like this affects every cemetery in the community. So, you know, although I, I, I respect the pictures being sent around, but that's not representative of all the cemeteries that, that, that deal with this money that eventually gets passed down to them. So uh, I, I do appreciate everybody's time on this. I'm glad that we had the opportunity to have this debate. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Thank you, Madam Chair. In conclusion, um, I, I don't know that I could disagree more with uh, Legislator Daniele. And again, I will ask that everyone reconsider whether or not um, in their judgment or whether we're doing enough, respectfully, we are not doing enough and we are not doing the duty to the dead and dying here in Monroe County with the conditions that exist and not setting any guidelines to the bare minimum of what they should be. Um, why then even bother to, to do anything at all? I have no doubt that the people um, that have been talking have more in mind of what they want, no doubt whatsoever. And if it's only one person that goes without a marker or that marker dies, uh, is illegible Ill uh, within a year's time, it's one person too many. Um, to say that, that you are uncomfortable with dictating policy to a family on how to spend a mere $1,250 is unconscionable to me when so many have come away from the office and with respect, Ms. Reed, hearing the news that they don't have enough money to do anything but cremate their loved one. If that's not dictating policy with regards to funding, I don't know what else is. This is a very frustrating thing for me. I do believe that this can work and we have asked for information and not been given it in a timely fashion to address some of the concerns that Ms. Reed brought up today. But again, if one person goes buried poorly, it is one person too many and we do have the power to change it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Questions, discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Not? No. Two to three fails. Are there any other photos? If not, then our next meeting would be October 22nd on Monday at 5 p.m. We are adjourned. <laughs>